call the meeting to order at 601 on the whatever the date is tonight the 25th of august uh let me pull up the agenda here um meeting minutes uh anybody have any comments about the meeting minutes from august 11th not me nope, nope. Okay. Hi, this is Jared from DMC here. Oh, okay. Great, thank you for joining us. Um, okay, uh, do I hear a motion to accept the minutes from August 11th? Well, we approve the minutes from August 11th. Uh, uh, second. Voice vote, oh God. Voice vote, all those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Fred? Aye. Me, yeah. Okay. Uh, vendor and pay payroll warrants. Everybody okay with those? Yep. Okay. Um, motion to approve. Move. Oh, we approve uh, the second. warrants. No, we don't actually have to vote on that, right? Oh, we don't. You know, okay. I always forget that. I apologize. Nope. Okay. Um, public comments um, for those items not on the select board agenda. Um, I see we have an email from uh, Shelly Yagajinsky uh, to the select board uh, and the Board of Health regarding COVID-19 reporting. Uh, Brian, do you have that letter to read publicly? Um, yep, I do. And I just, wanted, I just want to mention that there was a response from the Board of Health uh, to Ms. Yagajinsky, yeah. um, you know, informing, of, um, informing her of, of what the Board of Health does and how it tracks COVID cases and that, and that kind of stuff. Um, Why don't we read both then? Sure. Uh, so the, the original email um, said, this email is intended for the Waitley Select Board and Waitley Department of Health. The purpose of my email was to learn more about how Waitley is handling, monitoring the number of current COVID-19 cases I recently learned that a neighboring town has a COVID coordinator that gives a weekly status update on the number of new cases to the select board. And then a robocall will go out to the residents in order to keep their town numbers up to date and informed. They use Maven software to monitor the cases. Is this software something that Waitley is currently using? And who is currently in charge of monitoring the town's infection rates? Would it be possible for the town to do a weekly robocall with infection rates to keep us all informed? I found it strange that at the joint BOH and SCM, which I believe is Board of Health and School Committee meeting last night to discuss mandating masks for our children in school, that not one elected official spoke to what the present infection rates in our district towns current are currently at. Thank you in advance for answering my questions. Respectfully, Shelly Yagazinski. Um, and that was, so this was the answer from the Board of Health from uh, Fran Fortino who is the uh, chairperson. Uh, dear Shelley, the Waitley Board of Health uses the state's MAVEN, M-A-V-E-N system for disease surveillance as all municipalities in Mass do. Our Foothills Health District, which Waitley is part of, has staff that monitor the MAVEN system daily, often multiple times a day to investigate and follow up on COVID cases. As you heard at the joint meeting you attended, all FRS towns have experienced new COVID cases in the last two weeks and the numbers in Franklin County continue to rise. Thus, the SCM and BOH has prudently made universal masking in FRS schools mandatory to start the school year following CDC guidance. This decision will be reviewed periodically. We have used robocalls in the past and may do so again when warranted to inform residents about COVID and ask them to wear masks, get vaccinated, and take other precautions to keep us all safer. We also regularly use the Waitley Town website and the Waitley Scoop to inform residents about public health concerns. Thanks for asking about our COVID monitoring procedures. Hope this clarifies them for you. Stay healthy. Fran Fortino for the Waitley Board of Health. Okay. Anybody have any comments? Uh, I'll, oh. just add, I'll just add that since um, this, so the email, the original email was dated August 19th. And Fran's reply was August 20th. But since that time, the as we all saw, the uh, the Commissioner of Education was granted the authority to impose uh, mask mandates in school. And that has been uh, imposed at least through, there's, it's more detailed, but at least through August, uh, October 1st um, for all schools under the Jesse's control, essentially. 
And I understand it's um, indoor masking. Yep. That, um, that outdoors, you know, so if there's activities outdoors, they're not necessarily masked. And then sports was kind of a different thing, but they didn't get all into the details of that. I listened into the nearly four hour long meeting with the school committees and the boards of health. So that was de definitely thoroughly, thoroughly discussed. Right. Right. Okay. Um, Fred, you got anything before we move on? No, I got, no nothing new on that. Okay. I mean, we've, 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 we've done the job of, of the, of the public, public comment we've heard and we've heard the response. Um, and, and this is really squarely in the hands of, of the board of health at this point. Yeah, and in the case of the four hour meeting that Joyce and I, well, <laughs> jo Joyce had stronger staying power than I did. Um, but, um, but yeah, okay, great. All right. Um, let's see. I'm sorry, I'm distracted by my dog who sees five deer in the back in the backyard. Um, so I apologize. Um, uh, public hearing, uh, to hold a public hearing and to vote on application for debilitating medical conditions treatment center, um, storing up to 8,000 gallons of liquid propane at its facility at Seven River Road. Brian, what do you got? Yes, yeah, so I'll read the notice and then the board can uh, open the public hearing, ask the applicant to present. Um, the board can ask questions of the applicant, open it up for public comment. Um, then once you guys are set with public comment, you can close the hearing and take a vote if you're so inclined. So I'll read the legal notice first, okay? Please. Um, legal notice, Town of Waitley, the select board of the Town of Waitley will hold a public hearing on Wednesday, August 25th, 2021 at 6 p.m. via Zoom. And there, I won't read the Zoom link. Um, debilitating Medical Condition Treatment Centers Incorporated of Seven River Road, Waitley, Mass has applied for a new license to install, um, so it says eight 1,000 gallon propane tanks at Seven River Road, Waitley, Mass. Application for the license is to be considered under the provisions of Massachusetts General Law Chapter 148. But I, I think the application is actually for four 2,000 gallon tanks. Um, but uh, Jerry can talk more about that. So I would recommend that the board open the, open the public hearing. Okay, public hearing is open. Um, comments? You want to have Jared give a, give I mean, a quick rundown? Please. please. So I'm joined here by uh, Mike George, um, who is the provider of the um, the tanks and um, going forward will be the deliverer of the uh, liquid propane. Uh, Mike, are you on the line? I don't see him no, as a I separate entrance on Zoom. I don't see him. Um, hmm, okay, let me... Uh, I, I can certainly speak to it, uh, but he, you know, he's, this is his, his business. Um, we've, you know, contracted with um, uh, George Propane, which is um, a provider of liquid propane in the area. They will install it, um, you know, per the specs for the state uh, regulations. These are designed uh, to feed um, both our West greenhouse, which is part of our current phase of proposed construction and the East greenhouse. Um, so they're designed to feed um, the 40,000 square feet of greenhouse that we have spec'd out in our approved um, site plan, um, as well as the three support structures. Um, and so these are a critical element of our ability to do the, um, the mixed light growing that we intend to do. Um, and so we have gone with um, a local and well-known reputable provider of both the, the installation and uh, hardware. Um, as well as, you know, a consistent ability to fill these things as we need. Um, so as you can see from the uh, map that Chris Chamberlain of uh, Berkshire Design Group prepared, um, the farm is the required distance from our all significant uh, structures on the site. Um, and those would be the barn and the solar panels that are installed. Um, and so the uh, and so the application is is designed to meet regulations and to satisfy the needs of our of our operation. Still nobody from George Propane, I assume. I don't the the um, document is up, so I don't see everybody on the on the screen right now. Yeah. Um, well I think correct. Let me it, it, go ahead, Jared. 
I, I was just going to see if I could text him and see if he can join. Um, if he can join. Uh, but I, in the meantime, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Mike, are you? Uh, apologies. And I'm calling you from the from the uh, nursery here. My wife has just had our third child, so I'm got oh, the new right, babe in one hand. And I was hoping Mike would be. Thank you. I, th I was hoping Mike would be here to answer these questions. Mike, are you available to join? So. And I'll just I'll just add for the board the the um, the application has been endorsed by the fire chief, so he's he's met them on the site and signed off on it. So under Master and yeah, actually yeah. requires a permit and a license. Um, and Brian, for, for clarity purposes, and, and maybe I'm not understanding, but the public hearing is, who's the official presenter at the public hearing? Is it Jared or is it Mike? Um, it's who, it, it really can be either. It's... I, I guess my question is, 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 is this something that without Mike, we're going to need to continue? No, no. Jared's the one who signed off on the application. All right, fine. I just, I just didn't know logistically whether. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, it's on. It, it was signed on behalf of. Oh, Mike. Mike is uh, is calling me now. Hold on. Well, we're trying to get Mike in here, <coughs> um, Brian. Hey, or... hey. Hey, Mike, I've got you on the line with uh, with the select board as well. Okay, I'm sorry. I for no some reason had it broke down for tomorrow night. Okay, no problem. No problem. Let's, at all. let's Joyce. What were you saying? Yeah. Um, I was going to ask um, if we have in town any other comparable propane tanks uh, at other facilities. Um, I don't know if anybody here happens to know the answer to that. Uh, if if uh, John Hannum were here, I bet he would know. But um, I, I was just wondering, maybe Jim knows, maybe Brian knows. Um, yeah, I know over at um, Full Bloom, at least. The... Wait, one at a time, please. I'm sorry. Why don't, why don't we let Why don't we let Mike from George Propane? He because he probably did most of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, over at um, well, they've changed the names now, but um. Uh, I can't remember the name, uh, you know, right where the lights are and they used, they were growing the, um, they caught me off guard here. So, uh, they were growing the sprouts. Um, Kang's? Chang farm. No, it's, uh, the one that used to grow flowers. Anyway, right, it's right on, it's right on five and 10. Oh, uh, you know, they got the, oh, the oh, lights oh. in the greenhouses at night. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. I know which one you mean. Yeah. We have eight yeah. 1000 gallon tanks there. Okay, and this one is uh, the same size or just comparable uh, size? This one would be four, yeah, comparable, four 2,000-gallon tanks. So the initial oh, okay. installation is, is two 2,000s, mm -hmm. um, and then we're, uh, we're applying for 8,000 total to leave room for expansion. Okay, so you're talking about the tanks at, at, at Full Bloom, you're talking about the tanks that face 510 and are surrounded by what should be much larger arborvitae that currently <laughs> exists. I don't know. See, personally, I think the tanks are beautiful, and I would prefer the, the, <laughs> the arborvitaes to be very low, but not everybody appreciates the look of the that, tanks like I do. Mike, that would be great marketing on your part. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, <laughs> um, okay, but, but those are the, yeah. the correct. So we're, we're talking each yep, tank. those are 8 thousand. So we're talking each tank is double in size, but obviously the – the, the square footage is the same or, or is it a little cubic uh, footage cubic footage well in terms of footprint i'm talking about oh. yeah footprint's a little smaller actually you get to save some space with the 2000 gallon tanks so the footprint is a little smaller with the four 2000s versus the eight 1000s and it's obscured from the street so our property is a flag lot and so the cna building um is uh is sort of in front of it and obscures the sight of it from the street got it okay well that that answers my my question about sight lines so thank you yep yep we're we're a good 400 500 feet from from the street and you can't see it we've got our wooden barn in front of it um you know as you're coming north to south on river road um there's the barn the house the um the uh, the Annis property and then the CNA building all all provide um, 
you know, sight line protection from the public right of way. Okay. Other questions? And from and from our neighbors, it's also protected. It, it's on the other side of our um, our tree line uh, on both sides, so you can't see it from the the Chang property, and you can't see it from um, from the Smith property or or others. Yeah, that was going to answer my question of where, how, whether it was visible from River Road. Yeah, not, not really. I mean, if you're, if you're really looking for it with binoculars, I mean, so, you know, un, without the aid of, you know, binoculars or, or other things, it's not really visible. Okay. Um, what other questions do people have? I, I guess, I, I guess I, I, again, I'm going to show ignorance in asking this question. Um, how accessible is this to people who wanted to make a big explosion? And is that possible? Um, so, so just broadly speaking, the property is under constant surveillance. Um, there's no trespassing signs. Um, there's signs warning people that it's under surveillance. Um, at night, um, you know, we'll, we'll be having um, guards present. Um, so this is a this is uh, as secure as you get. Um, you know, certainly in this area, um, this is a, a, a pretty well uh, monitored and protected uh, property. Okay. Yeah, and it's in terms of the the setbacks and everything, it meets or exceeds all the setbacks as required in FPA fifty eight. Um, so and it exceeds them, I think, in most most of the distances. Um, in uh, like Jared said, is yeah. I mean, it doesn't get much more secure when you have surveillance. Um, and there's you know all kinds of safeties. And obviously, if somebody's intent on doing damage to anything, you know, it's hard to stop other than armed guards. But yeah, it's pretty secure. There's a lot. Put it this way: there's a lot easier targets. Okay. What else do you guys have? I guess I just wonder if uh, Tim or Jim have any uh, thoughts on this. Um, I think Tim probably lives close down there, so he may that may be why he's here. I'm wondering if that's if if it's time yet to hear from other folks. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I I guess I never knew where the tanks were going. Um, is Jared? Do you plan on how many more would you plan on? How much would you expand this to? No, no, this is the this is the maximum size for the for the farm uh, for yep. the uh, tank farm. And is it fenced it, in that can, area, or, or is it not? If they're just sitting on a pad or, or on the ground, either on a cement pad. Yeah. So if you if you walk onto our property, Tim, and you turn to the left, um, yep. you know, towards kind of behind the barn, basically, um, that that's where it is. It's um, you know on the other side of I think. Larry had um, like an animal run back there yeah. um, for sheep and, and things. It's, it's behind that animal run. Okay. So the, the farmhouse, the farmhouse and the barn kind of commonly uh, obscure the sight lines for you. Yeah. I guess my only, my only concern would be if, if it ever went off and I know you don't hear about it, propane tanks exploding, but when they do, it's just a flash. So that's just, that would be a bigger flash. <laughs> right. Um, and maybe Mike can speak to that. Yeah. I mean, it's, they don't, if, if there is a problem, it's usually not a explosion of the tanks. There's a leak, you know, if there's a leak and that's why it's odorized so that when, if there is a leak, even the smallest leak, you can smell it from hundreds of feet away. So that before it gets to the point where um, it could be dangerous, someone is alerted. And especially if you guys are going to have personnel there, I mean, it would be pretty, yeah, we have, the, we ha basically have these installations everywhere and, and it's just a larger version of what you have. Even at houses have, you know, two 1000 gallon tanks at your house, you know, the bigger houses and they're just happen to be underground tanks. There's, but this is a relatively, I know it sounds big, but it's a pretty small installation in terms of a commercial installation. Um, and we make sure we pipe it with all the safeties and distances and um, do everything we can to make sure it's safe. There's, you know, there's danger in everything, and propane is, I guess, inherently dangerous because it's a flammable fuel. But 
I think we have a pretty good track record of trying to do a really good job of installation and making sure we meet the codes and that we do proper maintenance to make sure that there are no issues. No, we're just, we're just supposed to ask obviously, but I, yeah. yeah. Sure. No, no. Yeah. I mean, I would expect the questions. Absolutely. I, I'm, I, I don't have any other questions. Do you guys? I, I have no questions. No, no, I would, I would only add that it, it's to me, it's very meaningful that John Hannum has signed off on this. And if um, Tim, um, Tim, you're, in, you're a neighbor, is that right? Yep. Yeah, I'd be glad to meet with you too once we get the installation going to go over the whole thing to explain it and show you what's what. And that way you have more knowledge of it. Okay. I, I just, I guess I never, I didn't see it on the plans before. So I would just wonder why it was, why it was on this one, you know, why, why it wasn't presented at the original uh, site plan and it came up. It, 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 it actually was on the original uh, site plan, Tim. It was, um, it's in the exact, it's in that same place. It's, I think, identified with little uh, like oblong uh, circles, I guess. Um, but I believe that was on the original site plan. Okay. Okay. Um, Brian, does this require a, a motion and a vote? Yeah, you want to close the hearing and then take a vote if you have all the information you want. Okay. Unless there are no other comments, um, I will. Uh, do we need to? Do we need a motion to close the hearing, or can I just close it? Uh, it it's really up to the board, I think, in terms of how you want. Gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll move that we close the hearing. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Oh, sorry. I know you got to call names. You have Joyce. Aye. Fred. I, me, yeah. Well, looks like he froze again. Okay. Oh my gosh. Does this mean I get to take over? Oh, <laughs> you know, I love that. That's my favorite part of the meeting is when I get to take over. Maybe we should give him a minute if we're gonna if we're gonna vote. Oh yeah. See, good thing I had that other um, that other sheet out, the one with the uh, oh crap, where is it? <laughs> oh, there we go, the one with the public hearing. Okay, but, uh, close the hearing and then vote to grant or deny the application. Okay. I bet you he'll come back on now. Let's get him a moment. He should be back in a few seconds. How are things up there? Did we we survive the drenching rains? I take it with not too much. At seven. Bad. Not bad. Um, yeah, it was a big. It was a big nothing down here on Long Island where I am right now. They they actually closed the lab for that was going to be for forty eight hours, but once that turned into such a fizzle and that landed um, um, substantially to the east, they uh, made the lab closure only twenty four hours. So I was happy because, well, that's what I came here for is to use the lab. So yeah. All right. Well, you're the vice chairs. Oh, I maybe. Hey, he's back. He's back. Yeah, there we go. Maybe. There we go. Okay. All right. Um, I'm willing to uh, make a motion, if that's okay. I'll make a motion that we uh, grant this application. I will second that. All those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Fred? Aye. Me, yep. Yeah. Sorry, I lost connection for some reason. No, oh, that's okay. We talked about you the whole time you were gone. Well, I don't blame you. Um, okay. Uh, old business. 
Um, Brian, uh, request for interest, ideas, innovation for Waitley Center School. I saw we got additional feedback. How do you want to deal with, how do you want to move forward on this? Thank you, guys. Um, uh, I'm signing off. Thank you. Bye, Jared. Bye, Thanks. Mike. Yeah, bye. Take care. Bye. Um, so I, well, let me summarize just the comments that we received. And I also, I also have some proposed changes. Um, we'll talk about the, the, the major ones. I assume you'll grant me the pleasure of editing it, all my mistakes. So um, I, I mean, really the, I think what, what came up was the milk bottle. Um, we received comments from, so we received comments from uh, Fred Olosky, Donna Wiley, Judy Markland, um, and um, I'll, I'll just summarize it, but the main was what to do about the milk bottle in the RFI. Um, there's a letter from the, his, from the his, Historical Commission talking about the Historical Society's request um, that the RFI stipulate that the milk bottle remain on site um, and that the Historical Society have sole access to it. Um, so the RFI didn't really say much about that either way. Um, it made a brief reference to the, you know, preserving the historic character of the building and the milk bottle. Um, and I have, and then uh, Fred Olosky's comment was that the milk bottle can be moved anywhere. It's, and it shouldn't, it shouldn't dictate what happens with the, with the building. Um, in terms of, this is, this is my opinion now, in terms of the RFI, I guess the discussion has to be whether at this point, the board wants to say that the milk bottle is staying or do we wanna just hear what people have to say and hear their ideas? Um, I guess that's where we are now is the RFI is non-binding. It, it's, uh, it's an expression of, of generally what the town, you know, what the, what the well, really the select board um, wants to see from any proposers. So if you're open to the milk bottle moving, um, then, then, I, and then I don't think we should restrict the proposals um, while the response is in the RFI. Um, if we're 100% sure we want the milk bottle to stay, then I think that that might be something we should include in the RFI. I'll speak for myself that I think, I don't think that we, we should at this point restrict the responses from the RFI by stipulating something about the milk bottle, though I do think we should encourage creativity about how people would would utilize the milk milk bottle as part of their business model, uh, as part of their usage, and if not, what they would suggest the town do with the milk bottle. So, because it, it, we're at the stage where no idea is a bad idea, um, it doesn't mean that we're going to go one way or the other. But I would I would suggest that we we seek the the creative advice and counsel of respondents with how they view the art, the, the, the milk bottle. And then we can make a decision about, about the milk bottle when we go into the RFP mode. That's my two cents at least. I would essentially agree. Uh, I would put wording in there that we, rather than that we stipulate that the milk bottle must stay, we express a strong uh, reflect the public opinion seems to be that they would like the milk bottle to stay, mm -hmm. but not that it is a ironclad stipulation for a proposal. And if someone has a proposal that involves it moving, yes, please give us ideas. Tell us what you would do with it if you can't have it as part of your center school proposal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mostly want people to know that they're, they're not buying the milk bottle. If they're, you know, if they're, pro if they're proposing something like, like if, when it gets to the point of somebody buying something that I don't think the milk bottle itself is for sale. Yeah. And whether that gets taken care of by moving it, as some suggest, or as keeping it there with 
historical society having access to it. Um, I guess I'm, I'm not ready to say which is which. Clearly it can be moved, but it's at some cost. Um, it's nice that it's in the center of town though. Where else would we put it? <laughs> um, there's, yeah, so, so that brings, so that, you know, trying to decide that tonight is probably not the right thing to do. Um, but I, I don't know if there's a way to, to sort of put in there that, you know, well, the milk bottle's not really for sale, but maybe that's not really the, the right wording even, right? I don't think it's a question of the milk bottle being for sale. It's a question of the milk bottle staying on that, that whoever it is doesn't own is staying on that property, however. Yeah. Right. It, well, be, presumably it, this, it may involve eventually the sale of the property, right? So, so if I were going to look at a house and there was a basketball hoop right in the driveway, and I'd be like, if I buy this house, I get that basketball hoop, right? So I just, unless the buyer says something like, no, we're taking the basketball hoop with us. Um, and, and so maybe that's or we're just leaving the basketball hoop there, but you're not going to own it. <laughs> yeah. right. And we can use it whenever we want to, right? Right, <laughs> right, right. This might not be the right. This might be too early for something like that. But um, I mean, but it, it, I mean, it sounds to me like there is enough sentiment for kind of keeping it and keeping it there that might be worth saying something in the RFI. I would like creative feedback from RFA respondents as to what they would propose the milk bottle serves as a purpose. And if they, and if we unilateral or universally hear nobody's interested in having the milk bottle within 10 miles of the property, well, we've learned something at least. If we learned that, if we learned that, oh my gosh, goodness, the milk bottle is going to bring me a hundred more customers a, a year. Well, we've also learned something there. I, I just think that it's, it's a feature, and and to the 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 basketball hoop. I I'm not assuming if I look at a house that the basketball hoop is coming or going. I'm just assuming that it's not an absolute part of the sale. Yeah. So, yeah. I so so the question on the table though is what do we do in the RFI? What, what kind of language do we put in there, if anything? Again, I as I said before, I like I like adding language about. Um, we are looking for, uh, as, as part of RFI responses, we are looking for um, feedback and creativity around the value out of the milk bottle as part of the property or not as part of the property and leave it as open-ended as possible so that we, we get people's true feedback and, and, and feelings. Mm -hmm. And if Brian can craft that kind of kind of language, then go forth and multiply. Okay. I, I, I do also, is that, is, is, are we in agreement on, on that, that, no. that part of it? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Um, but, but I think I, I, I do want to make it more obvious in the, in the RFI that, that the town does not own the milk bottle and that mm. it's, it's, I guess it's not ours to sell, so to speak. So it's either it's either staying on there as through an easement or it's through some other arrangement with the with the Whitley Historical mm. Society. Or, or not. It, 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 or it, not. It's not right. That's fine. Okay. Um, so that's good. That that was the main thing. Um, another one of Fred Orlowski's comments was about about possibly the, the lot dimensions on the assessor's map being inaccurate. Um, suggestions about adding uh, photos of the attic. I can try to get those. Um, I'll make sure to get a rabies shot afterwards. And uh, I think that's, that's really about, about all the feedback that we had. Uh, actually, Judy sent something. Um, Yesterday, yesterday morning, um, and she was suggesting adding some language about, again, about the, the milk bottle, about the iconic milk bottle, um, and also just discussing um, what, what types of projects with the school would be eligible, would be oh, that, eligible yeah. for potential CPA funding. Right, because um, not, all, so not all people looking at this will necessarily know about those uh, financial incentives. Right. 
I think that I, rem- I remember you forwarded that and I thought that was a good idea. Yeah. Whether it's the exact language she gave or, or you want to shorten it, that's um, fine with me. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, really the last thing is, is, is timing. Um, I mean, I was going to, let's just say it'll go out on August 30th. That's, that's Monday. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I was thinking about how many weeks we want to have it out. Under ends in August. Didn't we talk about this at a previous meeting in terms of when we wanted to have a, 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 a conclusion target or was that another topic? I apologize. We talked about it. We talked about it briefly. I thought but so. we didn't. We didn't. Yeah, we didn't have the I don't think. And weren't we looking at the end of October? I think that's what Fred would had recommended, actually. Yeah. So I was thinking October twenty fifth. That's that's going to be uh, essentially about eight weeks, two months. Um, and we'll schedule. Uh, I'll coordinate with with Keith and um, whoever else you need to coordinate with about a uh, a site visit where interested parties can come and tour the building during the daytime. Okay. So eight make, eight so weeks sounds like a good window. Yeah. We'll make it to 25th. Um, and if we stick to our regular uh, select board schedule, we have a meeting on the 27th to talk about um, whatever we get. Okay. So okay. I'll, I will plan on, on making those changes and I will, I will, Plaster it across the region somehow. Um, okay. Hey, hey, Brian. On, on on a similar note, because I want to make sure that the same thing doesn't happen if this property were actually to be sold at some point. And I'm not saying it will be. I'm just I'm just making sure that we we have our our ducks in a row. Did did movement happen on the blue school building? Because it's now I noticed the lawn was cut, and I was wondering whether that was cut because of progress on his end or um, whether he just decided to be a good neighbor and cut the grass. Um, I emailed him two weeks ago and I haven't heard back. I don't know if that got it back on his radar or not, but I, I didn't get a response. So he, just, me he just cut the grass cause he wanted to cut the grass. We don't, yeah, yeah, I haven't heard back. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure. And, and, and we, we should all be focused like a laser beam on if something, if, if, if the decision were to be made that we would were to expend with the property, that that kind of treatment of the property will not be tolerated by a new owner. I don't know how you do that in covenants, um, but that would be a disaster. And I want to make sure we avoid that. Yeah. We're in a little bit different position here than, than we were with the blue school as the, as the the owner of the of the center school, so okay. um, we have a little bit more leverage. Okay. Okay. Um, does anybody else have anything more to say about the uh, RFI before we move on? Nope. Okay. Let's go to uh, Poplar Hill Road and the speeding issue, Brian. Um. So after a meeting, and after the the electronic message board had been up there for. Um, a couple of days, uh, I think uh, maybe Jim got a phone call. I got a phone call. Keith got a phone call from uh, Mr. Cooney. Um, and he had also sent an email to the select board that I included in the packet. Um, and he said it was a good, it was a good educational experience to under, to, to see the actual speed that the vehicles were traveling. Um, and most seem to be traveling Um 30 miles per hour or less. Um, so in terms of speed limits, it's probably, well, his thinking is that um, he doesn't want, definitely doesn't want to post it at 40. Um, and also I think just, um, I, I don't, I, I think his wish is that the speeds, you know, the posting of the road not happen. Um, but he also tried to keep alive the idea of removable speed bumps. So that's pretty much hmm. where we are now with 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 that request. I know, I know Jim has kept the Jim has kept the, the, the board up there to, to collect data 
Um, I think it's been, it's been about two weeks of data, I think. Um, and I don't know if you have any updates, Jim, about what you see up there. Um, the only update, we do have two weeks worth of data. Um, I've got the fastest speed at just over 31 miles per hour. Um, so it, it looks like under 30 is kind of the, the average. Um, Gabe, when I spoke with him, he did want to, um, I, I was assuming he was going to be at the meeting because I think his plan was to ask the select board to not um, send a letter to the state requesting the study be done. Um, mm. And then the the only other thing that he added was he was going to reach out to Smith College to see if they would mm. entertain uh, possibly funding a, a sign to put up there as well. Um, and then the only other thing was the, the additional <clears throat> speed bumps or adding the, the, the uh, temporary speed bumps up there. I think that was his only, only thing that he would still like to see, but I'm not sure that that's really cost effective for the town to have to purchase those and put those up and deal with those if, if there is no uh, real mm. concern. Do you think um, the that I mean I, I understand a car going by at thirty miles an hour can seem really fast. Do you think, or maybe maybe you don't know, but do you think that's possibly what's happening there? Is that it's perceived as being really fast, even though it's only thirty miles an hour? That that's exactly what's happening. My so my conversation with him yeah. was okay. he, he went out saw a car coming and said that car is going way too fast, so he went out to see what the display on the sign was and it displayed 26 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was his education that his uh, estimation of their speed was, was, um, was off. Yeah. I, I think he's just used to the, the years and years and years that he's been up there of cars going 10 miles an hour or less. And now they're going, you know, 30 miles an hour or yeah. somewhere around there. So it, it does seem to, to be much faster than, than he would like. Right. If the actual well, non-posted limit is 40 miles an hour, it does seem that putting speed bumps is kind of, I, that, that doesn't really sit right with me. If a road is really okay for 30 miles an hour and maybe potentially even 40 miles an hour, if that's, you know, if we were to go and look into it further, putting speed bumps on it just doesn't really seem right. That seems kind of inconsistent. That seems like anybody who lives in a 40 mile an hour zone could then say, hey, I want speed bumps up front of my house um, to change this you know, 40 miles an hour to one, what's essentially 20 miles an hour when you're right in front of my house. So I'm not, I guess I, I, I'm, not, I'm still not crazy about the speed bump idea. Um, I, I don't think it's a good idea to set a precedent to put speed bumps in front of someone's house because they asked for it without an objective good yeah. reason right like if the state i don't think 30 say, i don't think 30 miles an hour is an objective good reason right well and, and if the state came in and said man this road ought to be 20 miles an hour then i'd say okay speed bumps do slow people down to the 20 mile an hour range then maybe that's appropriate but but in the absence of something like that i i can't see putting speed bumps into a place that technically has a 40 hour mile an hour speed limit i mean there's no matter how much the person you know living there might want it my issue is that <clears throat> i mean he understands that he's hamstrung in terms of not wanting to be at the state's urban and suburban limbs as opposed to rural understanding of rural life in massachusetts yeah. um but Somebody going 30 miles an hour on Poplar Hill Road visually is, is very different than somebody going 30 miles an hour on Swamp Road or Westbrook Road or, or, or wherever. It's, it's just a smaller road, I believe. It's, it's a it's wider than it used to be. I understand that. I understand that, but it's um, still, yeah. it's still, a, I don't know. It, it's, it, I, I get the sentiment. I, I really do. It is a dead end road. Um, 
but it has a speed limit of a throughway. And that's just the reality. And I, I don't want to just throw up our hands and say there's nothing to do. I want to figure out how we can be creative. And I'm not saying I have that solution, but mm -hmm. it, it is a different specimen than a road that travels from X point to Y point with entrances and exits on both ends of the road. Well, right, right now, the speed limit may be 40 de facto, but it sounds like people are treating the speed limit as 30. Right. I, Which is not... For that road, it particularly it may seem fast, but I don't think it's particularly unsafe speed for that road. Well, Fred, I, I would only counter that and say that I think there are people on Christian Lane that would say 35 might be too fast for that road. And, and Christian Lane is obviously a much more significant road in terms of travel, et cetera, than Poplar Hill Road. So I, 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 it's subjective, obviously. But the speed limit on Swamp Road and, 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 and Christian Lane are 35 miles an hour. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, but I think I'm right, correct? Correct. The, the one portion of Christian Lane, yeah, there, there's one portion that's 40, but right, the right. most but part is 35, yeah. The, the west side of Christian Lane is 35. Oh, yeah. And so we have a road... That is, I would argue, should not have the speeds of those two roads at 40 miles an hour. So it's why I don't want to just throw up our hands and say, oh, nothing we can do. Well, I, nonetheless, if you don't have something that we can do. But and the other thing I would say is whether that's a through road or not might depend on who you are. It might be going through to your destination. I, I get that, but, and, but, but so but, I, I, I I don't accept the argument that these people had a dead end road and they should have a dead end road for the rest of their life, no matter what's built the other end of the dead end road. That I mean, I, I don't I don't know that that's something that's in our power to preserve. Okay, but but Joyce, the other side of that coin is is that something was. Uh, and and uh, a, a, a project, uh, a, an organization, uh, whatever you want to call it, was placed on that road and that placement changed traffic patterns. Now, I love having that facility there. I think it's great for the town it, on so many different levels, but it by, def by default changed the traffic patterns and the lifestyle of people on that right. road. And as will any business moving on to any road, right? But we, so we don't preserve the roads. We make the best decision we can. And right now I think Gabe is right. The best decision is let's not pursue this with the state. Let's do pursue this with the people who own the facility at the end of the road. And we got the data thanks to uh, Jim and those new signs we have. I don't know that there's anything more this group can do at this point and so i i think it'd be okay to move on maybe send a letter on, a, on you know on behalf of the residents expressing our support for conversations around a solution to smith solution to the problem of people going 10 out 10 miles per hour under the speed limit <laughs> to the solution, no to the challenge of some right. residents yeah. Yeah, being uncomfortable with the realities that are confronted them right now. I think I think you have to remember too that um, from Gabe's perspective, Smith College, the the students, the traffic going up to the the facility there, those people aren't the issue. It's it's people that aren't using that facility that are just using the trails, and you know we're we're talking, you know maybe six cars a day that are going up there. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, to involve Smith Academy or Smith College when we don't know that they're the issue and residents have said they're, they're not the issue. I mean, it, it can't hurt, I guess, but. Jim, what was the total, what was the total traffic counter on a daily basis on average? Um, so the, 
the sign that we have, it is, it's not 100% accurate. And this is kind of the issue. But what it does tell me is, it'll tell me if it got the speed or if it didn't get the speed. So some of the vehicles we didn't get the speed for, but it still showed that there was something there. And it's in the area of about six cars a day on average. So that would be 12 to and from? Or three to and from? Uh, well, it's six, six cars that the sign's picking up. So just traveling in that direction, it only picks up coming towards the sign. Okay, okay. That was my, so so yeah. you, you, you're, you're six coming back the other way. That it's six going and six coming. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I, I think it's worth a conversation with Smith just to say, hey, here, here are the, and, and if I were, if I were Smith or any business, I'd want to know the sentiments of my neighbors, whether I do anything about it or not, I, you know, but at, at least let them know what is being discussed and if they have any. Yeah, my understanding you know. Gabe is doing that. Gabe is, well, right. that was but, one of the things he said he would do. As, as a town, we could, we could, we could send a similar letter saying, oh, okay. we, we are happy to, to help in conversations if, if need be. I know I suggested that three weeks ago and it got shot down, but if you want to do it now, I'm behind it. I'm, Let's do it. I'm fine with sending a letter from the town to Smith. Brian, let's do it then. Okay. All right. Um, uh, review, discuss, and vote to approve an easement agreement between the town of Whateley and Quanquant Farms for the purpose of constructing a water pumping station on North Street. Brian. So this is the easement that the town that the water department needs to construct the pumping station adjacent to the center cemetery. We had hoped that this could have been done months ago, um, but it turned out that um, the title search revealed some um, concerns that that our town council had in terms of in terms of ownership of the property, which have since been resolved. So. Um, what's included in the meeting packet is the easement agreement that was prepared by by our town council. Um, it's currently it's been sent to um, council for uh, the property owner, um, but we don't expect there to be many changes. I also forwarded to the to the board some of the uh, there's an easement plan, there's a site plan um, as well that that's going to be filed with this. But it's um, Approximately, I think it's just under uh, six thousand square foot easement. Um, the the select board, I I don't remember exactly the date of it, but the select board was authorized to um, accept the easement at a town meeting vote. I'm trying to see if I have here. I'll share the easement plan quickly. So this is the easement plan on the bottom here, Chestnut Plan Road, North Street. Um, here's the center cemetery. Here's the cemetery fence. Um, and this direction going this way is north. And this is the easement, this dotted line. Dark dotted line here is the easement. There's an existing easement. The lighter dotted line here is where the water main comes down. Um, so this is overlapping the existing easement. So it's actually a much smaller easement, but we're taking, uh, we're accepting just a, a rectangle because it's easier to do. Um, and then the pumping station will be constructed in here. It's gonna be, there's a lot of existing vegetation along the road here that's gonna shield it. Um, we really won't see it from the road. And there's also vegetation here that will we'll block it from Quan Quan. Um, and, um, pump, pumping station will be built here and then it'll connect into the water main here on the water main that runs through here and it will feed into the existing uh, water district system 
the reason why we're hoping um, that the board will, will uh, agree to accept this easement tonight is that there's an, a pending application before the Zoning Board of Appeals for the pumping station. And the Zoning Board of Appeals has, has been continuing the public hearing month after month, um, waiting for the easement to be um, finalized. So my concern is that if we don't, if we don't get this finalized soon, um, ZBA won't act until October, then there's a 20 day waiting period. And then we're really pushing into the time where it gets more expensive to construct um, in the winter time. So um, hopefully we can get this, we can get this finalized as ZBA can, can issue the special permit. Um, I believe they meet September 2nd, possibly. 20 day, you know, 20 day appeal period. Oh, um, so that would have us pouring concrete first of, you know, sometime in early October, which is still less expensive because we don't have to heat anything. So. Well, I would move that we accept this easement. Things has been clearly worked on and worked on and worked on and yeah, I would agree. As long as the uh, Quan Quan's property right situation is cleared up, uh, I would say we approve it and move on. Okay. Um, all those in, we've had a motion and a uh, second. All those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Fred? Aye. Me, yep. Okay, carried. Um, operator labor position, highway department. So there's a recommendation from, from Keith and myself to appoint, uh, to make an offer of employment uh, for the operator labor position to Eric, uh, Eric Elliott. I've uh, provided the board with a uh, redacted resume. Um, and that's uh, Keith's recommendation. You recall the, the person who was initially hired um, did not stay very long um, and got a job that was better off for their personal situation, I guess. Um, so this is our this is our next recommendation. Any questions? Nope. Move we accept it. I'll second that. All those in favor, Fred? Aye. Joyce? Aye. Me, yes. All set on that end. Thank you uh, for moving that forward, Brian and Keith. Um, special event application for Black Birch Vineyard for September 12th. Yep. Jim, they've reached out to you, right? I hope. Yes, they have. Yeah, okay. we've, the same, same plan as last year. We've approved that we have three detail officers scheduled for that day. Okay, so this is this is a a road race that that's happened maybe one or two times in town. Uh, it's it's based out of uh, Black Birch Vineyard in Hatfield. Uh, it's a ten mile race. Goes up um, to it goes up Conway Road up to Weber Road, and then it turns around. I believe um, it comes back through uh, the town goes on Westbrook Road and some other roads through Hatfield. There's a map in the, in the, I shouldn't, there's a map in the, in the yeah. packet here. Okay, I thought I saw one in there. Yeah. Goes along Westbrook Road, Chestnut Plain Road, Depot Road, Straits Road, and then back into Hatfield. Um, so the board had, had adopted this special event permit application really just to the, to facilitate the coordination among the different mm -hmm. departments, um, but nonetheless, it would it, it would require the the I guess the approval of the board to or the sign off of the board for this to go forward. Um, I know he's spoken with Jim. Um, the organizer has spoken with Jim, um, but I'll just follow up with with Keith and John as well. Um, yeah, because I don't see any of the department approvals on the application that's in our packet. Yeah, as, as far as I know, that they haven't been 
uh, it hasn't been signed. I, I think if the board's fine, I'm fine with just even an email from the highway department and fire department yeah. um, and police department saying that they're fine with it. Signatures right. are kind of a thing of the past, right, with COVID. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, some yeah, some documentation of the department's approval. I mean, I, I, can we make an approval conditional on those um, Board of Health, Highway, uh, SCEMS, Fire, and Police? Right, in, in the form yeah. of an email chain. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and yeah, and we can be yeah, we can be flexible. That email is fine for those. If if the approval coming tonight is important for them organizing, then um, I, I don't have any problem with yeah, giving conditional approval pending departmental approvals. Yeah, I'm fine with conditional approval as well. Okay. okay. If, if there's a real issue, then uh, the board's next meeting would be September eighth. It would be before this. Um, hmm. That's so. still before their race, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Do I hear a motion? Uh, yeah, I move that we uh, give conditional approval uh, pending the departmental approvals. Second. All those in favor of Joyce? Aye. Fred? Aye. Me, yes. Okay. That's done. Uh, updates, Brian. Hi, doll. I'm going to take off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, let's see, Cemetery Stone Restoration Project Phase 4. This is with uh, $13,200 in CPA funds that were appropriated at the last annual town meeting. Um, the uh, request for bids is out now, and they're due tomorrow, um, August 26th. I've received one proposal so far. Um, so we'll be, uh, I'll bring those to the board on September 8th. Um, with a recommendation to the cemetery commissioners. Um, FY22 state budget, uh, there was an earmark for the town of Whitley for $10,000 for its 250th anniversary celebration. Um, so I'll work with um, Susan in the 250th committee to get that paperwork uh, all set. Brian, uh, on, on that page, any idea when we have to get something back to them? I looked today, I didn't see a specific deadline. Um, but I, I assume we should do it sooner. Okay. Um, sooner rather than later. Um, so the positions that, that, so currently we're advertising for the community development administrator, assistant town administrator position, as well as the administrative assistant position. Um, those still remain open if anybody's interested and the, the job descriptions are on the town of Whitley website. Um, tax rate working group. Uh, Fred, I think this was your idea back on your yep. finance committee days. Um, so the timing of this is, is I, I think if, if we should probably start putting something together, uh, we typically look to set the tax rate, you know, November, December. Um, and last year was in, it was early December. Yep. So, I mean, we need, we need values. We need the assessors to finish up their val you know, valuations and then they submit it to DLS for certification. Once the property value, once the values are certified, then it's, then it goes to the select board to, to, to set the tax rate. So if we want to start looking at um, different scenarios of different tax, um, whatever we want to call it. I don't want to use the word scheme, but that's what's in my head. Right. Different tax uh, setups. Um, exemptions and things like that, then it's probably something we should, you know. Yeah, the initial discussion at. is really a philosophical one of do we want to have different rates and what are the arguments for and against? Yeah, and I think the one that comes up the most is the split tax rate, uh, commercial industrial versus residential open space. And one of the things we'll need to do initially is, and it's the, it's the Board of Assessors that needs to make this request, but it's a request to DLS that that they send us the information about um, qualifying, we'll call them qualifying businesses, right? The ones that um, would be qualified as a small business that would have a uh, smaller number of employees and that kind of thing. Then we could look at sort of who's left um, in yeah. terms of commercial industrial property. Um, so I don't know if that's uh, something that 
is if that's another committee or is that something that the like I think we're going to do it me. a working group, right? Yeah, I agree. And um, I guess who who wants to be who wants who wants to be well, on it? It my my idea, so I should be on it. Fine by me. Um, I think that makes sense. I think Cessers, um, Cessers, and, and this is going to be an understanding of revenue impact qualitative, quantitative impacts across the board, soup to nuts, correct? Based upon different changes or non-changes. Right, I think that that was my initial, that's what I said about a philosophical change is taking everything into account. Is this something we want to do or something we want to stay away from of essentially increasing or giving ourselves, not even increasing, but giving ourselves the option of increasing the resident, the industrial commercial rate as opposed to the residential rate. And, and the pros and cons of, of, of that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, do I hear a motion to create a working group? Uh, wait, before we do that, what's the composition of the working group? I, I, I think, think we Fred, keep Fred can do the whole thing. Yeah, I think Fred, Fred probably is all we need, really. <laughs> Small of one. Uh, what well, do you think that uh, someone else from the finance committee might be a? I think someone from the finance committee should be. Yeah. Yeah, and assessors. I would recommend those three. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Personally, I think that because it's not a town committee, it can include anyone. I actually think that um, a representative for, from. Those of those residents of Waitley that pay a property tax and a representative of a company that pays a property tax um, should possibly be on that committee as well for a committee of five so that it's not just government officials. We have input from people who are actually paying the fees. Now, is it a scientific sampling? No, but is it representation? Yes, because I think we should be aware of, of what they're thinking and feeling as part of this process as well. How do we recruit that, do you think? Smoke signals. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, we know, we, we know businesses, non-ag businesses, um, you know, from, from places like, like muffins or um, or neighbors, or the the filling station, um, Yankee Candle. Yeah, well, I'm not really sure book. where the line between large and small businesses is. So I think it might well, matter whether it's a. There, it's, there is a legal definition of who is going to be exact number of employees, and uh, I think Brian, what is it? Is it the total taxes paid or assessment of the property? I remember seeing something about it last year when we looked at this the first time. I think it's value of the property and number of employees at the local, at the location. Um, Is that combined or either or? I want to, I'm going to total, I'm going to guess right now, but I think it's combined. I think, I think it's and not or. Okay. I mean, I, I think I mean, I think one of the first, I think the analysis that needs to happen is really what, what businesses are going to be affected or not. Um, because mm -hmm. if, if you're representing, let's say a large corporation, you're probably not going to want to pay more taxes. No. Um, and we know that obviously. No, no one's going to want to pay more taxes. No. The, the question is what are the ramifications if they are asked to pay more taxes? Well, and that could be that could happen at one of our meetings when this group comes back to report. It's a public meeting, um, but I, I yeah, I, to me it's probably if the committee is supposed to be looking at like and asking for the information, who's the small businesses, who who would which businesses would be affected. We don't know in advance, we, you know, which business leaders might be good to uh, invite to that anyway. 
if we wanted representation from local businesses. But it, they are public meetings, so that's. And it also seems like the task is somewhat, I don't know, dry. It's like you basically you have to find out like what is what if we took care of the, did this divided tax rate? What you know what are what uh, like who's um, like how much could we benefit from it in in what kinds of ways? And then what are the detriments? I mean, it seems a little bit more dry. It's not really an opinion question. It's going to be crunching some numbers and being able to come up and say, well, these are the people who'd be paying more. These are the people who'd be paying less. This is how much less. This is how much more. I mean, th that's not something but, that's going to be. Joyce, I don't even opinion. think it gets that far in, at this stage because we wouldn't. it wouldn't be a question of setting a tax rate. It's, as I said, it's really a philosophical question of do we want to give ourselves or the finance committee or whoever an option of different rates, but I think we're going to need to know before we even set mm. into that, how many people, if we yeah, segregate uh, that's what I'm industrial, trying to commercial, right. how many businesses we'll are going to be affected. Right. But, but then, then I'm going to amend what I said and, and suggest that we invite somebody like Diana Seinel, who is the executive director of the Franklin, Franklin Chamber of Commerce, to sit in on, on, on this committee's work as someone who knows the, the tax structure and, 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 and how businesses are, in, are, are treated um, in all 26 cities and towns of Franklin County. Um, I guess I don't feel as strongly about it as you, John. I use, it's, it's sort of a, it's a local government governance kind of question. And yes, at some point you want input from from people who would be affected. Um, but I think the, the committee's initial work is really going to be kind of just talking, or maybe not talking philosophy so much. I think that philosophy is going to have a spreadsheet. <laughs> you know? Right. And, and, right. But I guess she would know, she would know data points in terms of what other towns have. Um, I, I don't know. I, 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 I've already got that information. Okay. That, most of the towns in Franklin County do not have a split rate. However, for instance, Irving does. For obvious reasons, right. For, right. right. Uh, and, and the back the, of the envelope calculation is 80% of our revenue is from property taxes of residents. 20% is from non-residential. All right. So if you raise... Now, you know, every percent you raise the tax on the 20 percent, you only lower by a quarter percent everybody else. So, I mean, that's sort of the back of the envelope. But I don't mind seeing more data and more details to see what options there really are. But I think that's the main reason, because the back of the envelope com uh, calculation doesn't work very well in most small towns. Yeah, I, I looked at this last year in advance of the rate setting mm -hmm. meeting and the way it is around the state most of the suburban areas and cities have split rates. Most of the more rural towns do not. But with the exception of certain towns that have uh, some anomalous circumstances, mm -hmm. like Irving, which has a single big industrial uh, employer. Town of Florida has a massive industrial tax. They've got a uh, hydroelectric dam yeah. that they tax and essentially subsidize most of the residents' taxes through that. And yeah. I think the question here is, is our industrial base big enough to justify doing that or not? Okay, let's just do it then. I'll 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 work with this until in, until there's the need for expanded data and public comment. Yeah. All right. Um, All right. So the working group is going to be those three organizations. Uh, do I hear a motion to create a working group with a representation? I'll, I'll make the motion. Board and finance. Okay. Yep. And second. All those in favor, Fred. Aye. Joyce. Aye. Me. Yep. Yeah. Um, let's see, I sent 
um, the board some information about um, the situation that was ongoing about the 61A conveyance and rollback tax um, mm -hmm. at uh, the property on the corner of State Road and Christian Lane. Really, the, the issue is whether um, whether uh, cannabis cultivation is an allowable use under Chapter 61A, which it's not clear. Um, so there's there's more to come on that, uh, but there's obvious financial ramifications to the town depending on how that goes. Um, so I mean, really, the issue is it, it's a novel issue because it's never really cannabis cultivation has never been legal, so it's really never come up. Um, and then until this point, there's been some ad hoc decisions around the town, uh, around the state. Um, it needs clarification. Are there any cases that have gone into court yet? Do you know? Not that I've heard from town council, no. I figure at some point, some some town will make a decision and someone will take them to court. Yep. <laughs> let's hope not. <laughs> right. let, let's hope it's not here, but yeah. somewhere, someone, this is it will happen and that will make this determination for us. Yeah. Are we sitting and doing, are, are we sitting and waiting or are we acting as the law currently stands on this issue? Um, so the, the recommendation from town council to the board of assessors is that um, it's, um, it's his opinion that the law has not changed on this issue. Um, funds have been escrowed and um, pending um, a decision from the legislature prior to the conversion of the property to the ineligible use because the property is going to be used for for agriculture for non cannabis agriculture through the end of December. If nothing changes between um, by nothing, I mean, if, if the legislature doesn't act, if DOR doesn't give an opinion um, on the issue, um, then it's going to come up. It's going to it's going to be a decision of the Board of Assessors, really, as to how it interprets six, the 61A. Can we just give a heads up to our legislators or their staffs to let us know what the status is? if there's anything happening in the legislature on the subject. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's just to keep everybody in the loop on what's, what's going on. Um, I did see, I, I, I was told today that the, the sale did close because um, we saw the, the deed was recorded in the registry. Um, it was, for quite a significant amount of money, actually. Um, so, mm. well, it's public record, so it was it was close to thirteen million dollars. Wow, that, that's the thirteen million dollars we didn't have to buy it. Correct. Yeah, I checked the couch cushions, but that that's mm -hmm. that's a good day's work. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the last update here is the 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 library accessibility improvements. That, that project's going to be going out to bid pretty soon. I know uh, Jones Woodset Architects is working on getting the bid documents together. So hopefully that will go out soon. And I, I don't see any reason why that shouldn't start late summer, early fall. Okay. Unanticipated items, Brian? Um, sort of, but not sort of. I don't know if, I, if I've conveyed this to the board, but... Um, our current assistant treasure collector, who, who's Janet, um, is going to be resigning her position and she's going to be moving, uh, getting more hours with Foothills Health District. So we'll have to um, fill that vacancy, the 10 hour position. Well, 10 hours one week, five hours the next. Um, so I want to ask around internally if there's interest, which I think there might be with current staff. Um, and then we'll post that position. Will there that that will potentially, if we're combining two part-time positions, obviously those are budget. There are budget ramifications to combining positions. Potentially. Um. So it's both of the so that position is fully budgeted under the treasurer collector. Um. 
No, but if people are working over 20 hours a week is my point. Um, if, it, if it kicked somebody over from yeah. like say 15 to 20, it, it would be an issue. Right. And, and um, so that's just, that, that we just have to factor that in, obviously, you know, yep. if, if we combine jobs, they're two separate jobs and we're essentially combining them into one person. Um, yep. That, 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 that's a budget impact. Yeah. Yep. We'll keep that in mind too. Okay. Okay. Um, anybody have anything else? No? No. Okay. Uh, motion to adjourn? Second. All those in favor? Fred? Yes. Joyce? Aye. Me? Yep. Okay. Good night, you guys. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Night. Thank you.